we've told you, we've told you about pretty much each week, we've told you about somebody else who's using StreamYard from TV, who's a celebrity, who's done a lot of different things in the public eye, and they've come over and they've started using StreamYard, and they're using it for their live streams, for their productions. And we have somebody today, another week, another Emmy winner, another Peabody winner. We have Madeline Smithberg. She's the co-creator and former executive producer of The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. And she's going to join us. She also worked as a producer for Letterman, for Steve Harvey. And she's hosting her own live streaming show, Mad in the Kitchen, here on StreamYard. So we're going to talk to her in just a few minutes. Let's do a show. Hey gang, Ross Brand here for StreamYard Connect. Welcome everybody. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2021. Uh, We've got a great lineup of shows for you here on StreamYard throughout the week, as well as here on StreamYard Connect over the next several months. We've got some awesome guests that are booked, and I'm I'm so excited to talk to Madeline Smithberg today because I want to hear how she's using StreamYard, how she came to use StreamYard for her Mad in the Kitchen show. Uh, But I also want to hear some stories from being the executive producer of The Daily Show, working on Late Night with David Letterman, working with Steve Harvey, and other stories throughout her legendary career in television. So it's going to be a fun interview. We're going to get to that in just a few minutes. Let's also talk about what's going on with StreamYard, uh, an, an interesting new development now is that there's more information available about the StreamYard producer program, and it helps if I put that up on this. So there we go. So um, if you are a StreamYard user, you're looking to use StreamYard, and you need some help with it, StreamYard has put together a group of people who are professional remote producers, can serve as consultants as well, whether you want to spend an hour with them discussing how you should go about doing your broadcast content, production ideas, or you want them to actually produce your show. We now have a a team of people. Um, I'm excited to be a part of it. So uh, you can work with me or with any of the other producers on the list. Marissa Callie's done a, a great job putting together a a team of producers who are available to help out StreamYard users who are looking for that support. Um, It's paid support, but it's it's high-quality help from people who are very experienced using StreamYard. And you can find that when you're in StreamYard, basically uh, go to the account menu And the drop down, there's partner resources. If you click that button, you scroll down to the bottom of that first page. There'll be a lot of different links on the left. Just scroll down to the bottom of that first page, and it'll talk about remote producers and consultants. There'll be a link, and you can look through uh, the different people who are listed and and see if there's somebody, if you're looking for, uh, you know, uh, to hire a consultant or hire a producer, you can look through that list of people and see if there is somebody that you would like to work with and then uh, there'll be information on how to contact them or contact StreamYard, uh, whatever might be the case. So uh, more more options for people who are using uh, StreamYard, particularly if you're new or you're using it in a professional situation or you have a complicated broadcast, it's a, it's a great resource to have. So we're, we're excited about that. Let's turn to the industry news. And of course, we have somebody from 
the TV industry, who will be our guest, Madeline Smithberg from Mad, Mad in the Kitchen in just a few minutes. But Chris Hansen, um, for those who may not remember, I think it was in the 90s, he was working on Dateline NBC, and he had a segment where basically he would set up for people who were how do I describe this? Uh, people who were basically trying to arrange dates and so forth with underage people through the Internet. And he would basically be there when they came in. It wasn't actually an underage person doing it. Um, I don't know if he called it to catch a predator, the segment, but his famous line is, would you take a seat? So the person came in thinking that they were going to meet this younger person in the younger person's house. And instead, Chris would be sitting there. uh, Would you take a please take a seat or would you please take a seat? And and then, you know, he would basically expose not physically exposed, but (laughs) sorry, I did. I'm trying to keep this uh, because it's a very serious issue, but he would basically put them on the spot. A lot of them would confess to what they were up to or that they had a problem. Others would deny it. And eventually a lot of them would try and run. The police would grab them afterwards. Anyway, it was a it, it was a well-known segment. It was hard to forget that segment if you watched it just one time. Well, Chris has been doing interviews using StreamYard. And he's got his own To Catch a Predator show on YouTube and he's put together a documentary on the YouTuber Onesian who um is somebody who is controversial on YouTube. I won't go any further because I don't know that much about the story and I don't want to cast uh any aspersions out there that I don't have the information to back up. I have not watched the documentary But what I do know is that he's talked to people who feel they've been victimized by Onesian using StreamYard. And those interviews are going to be a major part of this documentary. I mean, they have to be. Again, I haven't seen the documentary, but that's where all the conversations took place on live streams and recorded videos using StreamYard. So... Uh, Chris Hansen, who's a, a major network TV figure, uh, particularly through his work with Dateline NBC, is going to be putting this documentary out there. I believe it's already out there, and you can find it on uh, Discovery Plus, and it will include, as I said, a whole bunch of interviews that were done using StreamYard, and that's where he did the bulk of his research and conversations with people who had encountered Onesian and had stories to tell. I think I made it through that without stumbling too much over some landmines that are in that story. Didn't accuse anybody of anything, didn't make light of anything. So we are going to move on, but it is another issue, another item rather of note where a a big time TV professional is using StreamYard as part of their workflow. You know all about Clubhouse, right? Anybody who's online at all knows that Clubhouse, whether you've been on it or not, is blowing up right now. People are spending a ton of time in in Clubhouse, and it's basically audio-only conversations that are not recorded, and you have rooms. It could be a one-on-one conversation, or you have a virtual room, and somebody could be setting up a discussion about a subject, a tutorial, a presentation, uh, almost like a virtual radio show, depending on how they structure it. And that's that's just become insanely popular. Well, Twitter has purchased the podcast app Breaker. Now, Breaker is not going to become a part of Twitter. They're shutting down Breaker. But what they're going to do is bring the talent from Breaker, the CEO and the second in charge, definitely, I'm not sure if there are others, but they're bringing those two people in particular internal, internally into, into Twitter, and they're going to work on voice, conversation, style, programming, i.e. 
I assume, I, I shouldn't say I assume, right? But let's let let's put one and one together, right? This is going to be Twitter's version of Clubhouse. The, another big tech company is going to quickly get it together after seeing somebody go first to market and and put together a popular idea. Twitter is going to put out its own version of that as soon as possible. And that's why I believe they have purchased Breaker. That podcast app will shut down. Twitter, of course, is shutting down Periscope. So with with that, um, that is that is where Twitter is going, acknowledging uh, the power of Clubhouse, whether Clubhouse is a fad or Clubhouse is something that has staying power, that, that remains to be seen. But certainly it's caught the attention of the folks at Twitter. And some sad news. Uh, a lot of you who were involved in Blab and who've been just online on Twitter and other places may have gotten to know Kristen Cardos. She's been serving as the social media manager, community manager for Convince and Convert, which is Jay Bear's uh, company. He's a, a big name in the digital marketing world. He's a best-selling author, a New York Times best-selling author. He's uh, somebody who's a, a very highly regarded keynote speaker and just a big figure in the, in the digital marketing world for many, many years. And before Kristen went to work with with Jay, she was working with Brian Fanzo, who was one of the early power players on Blab and Periscope. And in particular, um, she was instrumental in putting together very much a behind the scenes person, although a lot of people knew her. But Kristen was instrumental in putting together Brian taking his podcast and his Twitter chat, merging them together and doing it as a live stream. So he would be live on Blab, holding a discussion and interacting with the people in the chat, while at the same time having a chat going on on Twitter. And of course, having a, a superb community manager like Kristen Cardos is what really made it all happen for those shows. The one, uh, one one I think was called Social Business Hour that he did with Rachel Miller. There was cloud talk that he did with Daniel Newman. Uh, but Kristen was the support. She was the backbone of all that. And she, my every encounter I had with her was always positive during that time. She was one of the first people that I asked to come on my show when I started it. And, and not only did she say yes, but she showed up for my first show without even being invited, stayed there the whole time. When I went to call, she was like the first one to come in. So a lot of people have been sharing stories about how she was like just super supportive behind the scenes to a lot of people. I, I hadn't been in touch in, in the last few years and, and her focus has been on uh, convince and convert and, and Jay's work. Uh, but I was very saddened to learn uh, over the weekend that she passed away. Uh, Kristen Cardos will be remembered by, by really anybody who was part of that blab community or, who got to know her through her work uh, in social media and community management. So uh, sorry to for the sad note, but uh, I, it really has to be acknowledged how important she was in those early days of social live streaming. And of course, you can host your show with StreamYard. If you're not yet using it, head on over to LivestreamUniverse.com slash StreamYard. I'm Ross Brand. The show is StreamYard Connect. We are here every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And you can join us on Facebook, on the StreamYard Facebook page. You can join us on the StreamYard YouTube channel, as well as on Twitter and Periscope for as long as Periscope is around. Uh, and that's on the I Ross Brand account. Uh, I want to say a quick hello to uh, some people who are watching over on Facebook is Brent Basham over on YouTube, Rob Zip. Good to see you both. Stephen Smith is here. Marion LaSalle, David Ricks, Beauty Bubble. Good to see you. Sue Webley is here. Kevin Hall. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I know I'm not going to get to everybody. Dana, you do it. <laughs> Good to see you. 
Mr. John DiStefano, uh, Saddam is here, Mike, Rio, Inspirational by Marie. Good to see everybody. Uh, NLTMW says, greetings all. Good to see you. Uh, Mark Warriner is here. And of course, Marion, I mentioned Marion LaSalle. Musafir is here as well. So thank you all for being here. It's great to have you here. And I'm, I'm hoping your 2021 is off to a good start. Um, and we want to get to our guest. We have a terrific guest. Uh, she is a TV legend, without a doubt. The co-creator of The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. She worked on Late Night with David Letterman. She's worked with Steve Harvey. She's an Emmy and Peabody winner. And now she's hosting her own show, Mad in the Kitchen. Welcome to StreamYard Connect. Madeline Smithberg, great to have you on the show. Hi, Ross. It's great to be here. Well, it's so awesome to have you here and to have you on the show. And before we get into what you're doing with Mad in the Kitchen and some... I'm sure there are going to be some funny and uh, crazy stories from the world of television. You just got back from a trip to Mexico, and I, I took this right off of your website. You, you mentioned the name Sam and a love story 34 years in the making. Tell us a little bit about Sam and about what you've been up to the last few days. <laughs> okay, well... uh Sam and I uh, were uh, met in New York City in 1986. That's the photo on the right. And uh, we fell madly in love. And we were together for about nine months. And as far as I was concerned, he was the one. And then uh, he unceremoniously dumped me. But it was kind of a weird thing because I, at that time, was obsessed with David Letterman I, the show was on at 1230. It was late night with David Letterman. There was no internet. You couldn't watch it the next day on your phone. Right. And I had stayed up one night. I'd been hearing rumblings and I saw this show and it wasn't an entertainment experience. It was really a calling. I saw the show and I thought I need to be a part of this. And I launched a one woman campaign that was unsuccessful for two years. And uh, at the very second that Sam broke up with me on the phone. Uh, he said, we have to talk. And my world started spinning and I was holding a piece of paper, which was a note from my roommate's mother. And I looked at the piece of paper as, you know, I was, the, the phone fell in slow motion, at least in my mind. And I felt like I was gonna cry and throw up at the same time, which was gonna be messy. And I looked at the piece of paper in my hand and it said, call Darcy about a job at Letterman. So I had this moment, uh, which was, I call it an emotional wash. It wow. was this single moment where all my dreams were shattered and yet another dream came true. And I lost Sam and I didn't see him for 27 years. And then he found me on Facebook and we ended up reconnecting. And I was uh, running the studio of, of National Geographic uh, Explorer in New York uh, three and a half years ago, I guess four now almost. And uh, he came to visit me twice. And at the end of it, he said, I don't know what I was thinking. You're the woman for me. Will you move to Seattle? And I said, yes. And then I realized I've never been there, but I'm sure it's nice. <laughs> and it is really nice, but it is also very rainy. I don't know if you have heard that about Seattle, but I've anyway, heard it a couple times. <laughs> but uh, so we just went to Mexico. We were supposed to get married on March twenty fourth of twenty twenty, the year we all love so much. Right. And I had sixty five people, and so did he, coming from all over the world to join us on a beach in the most beautiful place on the planet, which is Loreto Bay. It's on the uh, the Baja Peninsula, but right in the center on the Sea of Cortez. And my wedding was canceled. And we went in front of a judge, and it was very, you know, not what I was hoping for. I didn't get to wear my rhinestone flip-flops. <laughs> and uh, and it, we just went into uh, our honeymoon in quarantine, which I don't mm -hmm. recommend as a romantic experience. Because <laughs> all I could notice was, God, how many socks does he own and how many places can they be at once? And uh, 
So that was going on. And meanwhile, I had pivoted. I have always been obsessed with food. And when I moved to Seattle, I noticed along with the rain, there's not a lot of the network television opportunity. Right. And so I was about to turn 60 and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew it had to be something new. And I've always loved food. I used to produce all the cooking segments on Letterman. And uh, it was we had gotten married. We were in quarantine. I uh, I had. OK, sorry, I messed up the story. So about three years ago, he gave me a. A, a gift certificate and I did a cooking class and they recruited me to come be a chef at a place called Blue Ribbon. So I had pivoted. I went from TV producer to chef where I was at the very bottom of the pile as opposed to the top where I had <laughs> been. And it was painful. I got burnt and bruised, but I powered through. And when I turned 61, which was this past September, I actually said out loud to myself, I know that's weird. Uh, I said, Look at you, Madeline Smithberg. You're 61 years old. You're about to marry the man of your dreams. And you have pivoted to a new career as a chef. And then COVID hit. The wedding was canceled. Blue Ribbon closed. And I ended up lying on my couch in sweats for about three weeks, sobbing uncontrollably. And then one day, I don't know what it was, some force inside my being made me stand up. I was like, whoa, my feet still work. And I said, Sam, come into the kitchen. Here's my phone. Uh, I'm going to make some pasta and you're going to shoot it and we're going to put it on YouTube. And that's when my channel, Mad Boom. in the Kitchen, was born. YouTube.com slash Mad in the Kitchen. It's really good. And if you look at the early videos, I've got like I haven't brushed my hair. Uh, there's dishes in the sink. But it just kept growing and growing. And then Sky Gleason, who is now my co-producer, fell out of the sky. <laughs> I know it's corny, but it's true. And uh, he's like, I'm going to edit your videos. And then he started editing my videos and lighting my videos. And one thing led to another. Next thing you know, we're shooting outside in a garden with five cameras and a drone. And Matt in the Kitchen has been just growing and growing. And I started doing all this media and TV shows. And then I was on the Today Show on Election Day, and I'm going to be on it again wow. on the 21st of this month. And you had so, a video go viral. You, I had a video one of your viral. YouTube shorts went viral. It, it was crazy. It was my uh, my dad's inspirational uh, uh, Thanksgiving stuffing, and we put it up and tagged it as a short. Uh, thank you, Beauty Bubble, for that tiny piece of punctuation <laughs> that changed the course of my life. And next thing you know, I'm going on a hike with Sam. It's not raining. Right. And so you go outside and you do like more exercise than you would do in a month, <laughs> in a day, just because you can do it without getting wet. And I'm up on top of a cougar mountain, no jokes. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden I start getting all these messages on my phone, but they're mean. And they're like, is that a man? And she, she looks like Mrs. Doubtfire. And then many that I cannot repeat that were just dirty and awful. And I just got so upset. But then I go, wait, there's 10,000 of them. And then there were 20,000 and 30,000 and 40,000. And it went up mm -hmm. to like 129,000. And I had my first viral video. <laughs> and I was like, Mrs. Doubtfire is the best movie ever. <laughs> that is awesome. It's great how you were able to turn that around. Because that's life on the internet, right? When you get recognized, the good is there, but the bad comes with it. And, you know, it's not the same as in TV or in my cases in radio where the audience is somewhat invisible to you. Correct. Right? They yes, don't they have are. access in in to really tell you what they think. Um, maybe on a call-in show a little bit, but in general, <laughs> there's, there's one, no open forum and, and the internet's a lot different. <laughs> it, well, it was my sort of induction and, uh, the beginning of it was really, really, really horrible. And then they were insulting the stuffing. She did. She lost me at chestnuts. That looked like. <laughs> Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody has an opinion on stuffing. Like get over it. Go but you have to different. know how many people had to love it. And those people right. often either just gave you a thumbs up or maybe they right. didn't comment at all. They smiled and then they swiped up to the next one. So 
um, it, when you get that many people watching it, there are a lot of people who are enjoying it. And it, it was just great um, to see how you've gone to YouTube and really done a full range of content. You have recorded videos that are, you have some videos that are sort of tutorials, how to make a dish or how you make a dish. You have live streams and interviews and long form content. And now you, of all things, went viral with your first short. <laughs> it's so crazy. And we're also doing uh, Man in the Kitchen has grown and we now have, you know, four, uh, five at times, key, six, seven, like people that come in and like just help. I have a person that does my food prep. I have someone that helps me write my recipes. I've got people helping with the graphics. Like it's just been absolutely an unbelievable experience. And we're also doing Zoom cooking. And I kind of like, I thought I could do Zoom cooking. I had taught two friends of mine from high school how to make an, a, a Vietnamese turkey salad <laughs> and uh, lettuce cups in it. It was really good. And uh, I thought I could do this. And so I just put a like we made a, a you know, a, a graphic and I was like, Zoom cooking available. Next right. thing you know, we're booked solid. We've done we, have, we did one Amazon. We're doing another. We're doing the National Teachers right. Union, the local Washington Teachers Union. We're doing uh, RDH and Associates, which is my husband's company mm -hmm. and his boss's Christmas party which is net taking place in January. So this between the channels, so we do the episodes, which are just, here's something I'm going to make it and tell you about it. We do right. a lot of short form. Now I'm really getting into the short form because I just want to be insulted publicly. <laughs> and that seems to do the trick. And then the live is really, this is where it goes back to who I am and a person that has produced live and live to tape for three decades uh, comedy election night shows, State of the Union shows. Uh, I love live, and I've right. always loved it. And so we did one, and we had some technical issues, which we're ironing mm -hmm. out, but we did a pizza party where I wanted to play with the notion of live. And so we ordered pizzas, and we had pizza races. And that's something <laughs> you can't do on a recorded show. Like, it just right. doesn't work. You need the real urgency of the live. And it worked! And right. they both showed up, and one bought our bottle of wine. I had a house band. So I think like the true show that I, Madeline Smithberg, want to ultimately do, which means have somebody pay me to to do uh, and give us some resources, which we do not have right now, uh, right. but we're doing it. We're scrappy, uh, would be sort of a late night feel live cooking show with wow. comedy guests and po political guests and other chefs and music and comedians and just, you know, fun little playing with the world uh, and doing it live. I've got the live bug. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. That sounds... Are, are you looking to do it online, on TV, a combination? How are you kind of looking to integrate I TV am... and, and, and interactive online video? I don't really think there's a difference anymore. <laughs> I think that uh, streaming and TV have all blurred. You can, you know, anything you can watch on your phone is content. And right. I really am not. Uh, I will do with anyone who will write a check is what uh, <laughs> the truth is right now. Now, you, I imagine when you does that make me a, 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 like a, a, a not classy person? Well, you know, it I'm makes sorry. you a professional, I, I'm from right? New York. I tell it like it is. It makes you a professional. So. Uh... Somebody who works, does a job for a paycheck, right? And is good at it and has done it for a long time. Um, and so my, my, what I wanted to ask you is that when you were going, doing your training and you were, you were becoming a chef and you became a chef, and I'm sure at some point you made peace with like, okay, I had a great run in TV and I had some wonderful experiences and met wonderful people and won awards. And I'm okay with, I'm going to close that book. In fact, I'm enjoying my new life. I'm enjoying not the pressure of having to have a show on, right? I mean, that's where you, that's, um, I could, in my own small way, I went through the same kind of thing when I left yeah. radio. I never pictured I would be back doing this again. And well, times TV change and media changes and opportunities change. And you realize that this is an incredible way 
to communicate what you love and and what you like to do. And I mean, if I can start an empire on my phone in my sweatpants, <laughs> this is pretty cool. Uh, I never would have imagined that it would have, you know, come to this point. And I'm having so much fun. And I've spent three decades producing other people. Right. Some would argue I'm one of the best producers of talent that has ever worked in the business. Even Jerry Seinfeld told me that. Uh, and yet now I'm turning my skill set on myself. And it's real. I never, I never did stand up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I never wanted to be in front of the camera. If you put a mic in front of me, I would clam up. I hated the sound of my voice. I couldn't stand how I looked. So I just gave it to others and made stars. Made I made a lot of stars. Like if you want me to list some, Stephen Colbert, Steve Carell, John Stewart, uh, Mo Rocca, Ed Helms. Um, you know, just that's, I can't even like think of more, but there, and when I was mm -hmm. doing that Geo Explorer, our host got uh, basically arrested and uh, we had to do guest house. So I had uh, <laughs> Ted Danson was the host one week and Jeff Goldblum was the host mm -hmm. one week and Dan Rather was the host one week. And it was amazing. And I just had to turn these people who were professional entertainers, but they had never hosted. And you know right. that hosting is a specific animal mm -hmm. and during that time i really was impressed with myself and uh so now to be able to kind of like switch the entire picture around and focus it on me it's just a kick it's, it's nice just a kick it's nice to put all that work into your own project and see yeah, how that comes out of, and mad express in the yourself. Kitchen is mad in the kitchen is a comedy show mm -hmm. I am comedy is in my blood. I was a funny one in high school. Uh, you know, it's just I can't help it. That's who I am. I'm usually mm -hmm. the funny one in the back of the room, but now I'm the really loud, funny one right in the front. Right. And the show, even though it is about food and I love food and I think I'm actually a very good uh, cook and have great ideas. But my audience are people that have been scared of cooking and I make it really approachable. I make it very simple totally delicious but in ways that are attainable right. and i make you have fun so you forget that you're scared right. and uh <laughs> it's almost like you know the pill they give you before the colonoscopy so that's, <laughs> that's, that's a visual my uh my show but it's really a comedy show that has right. a lot of cooking in it mm -hmm. and uh even if you're not interested in food chances are you will be entertained because i'm ridiculous yeah, I mean, I look at some of the recipes and I say, you know, that's probably not something I'm going to make. But, hey, it's a fun live stream, so I'm hanging out till the end because I want to see what's going to happen next, what jokes she's going to tell, who she's going to bring on, how you're going to approach it. Um, so what made you decide to use StreamYard? There are a lot of tools out there for producing shows online. What, what made you choose StreamYard for, for Mad in the Kitchen? Okay, well, Sky Gleason, who I was uh, describing, who is now my you know partner in Mad mm -hmm. in the Kitchen and my co-producer on everything, gets up every morning and gets on this chat group called Office Hours yeah. that you know about. And there he finds out about all kinds of technical breakthroughs, technology that can support live streaming, I think is really mm -hmm. what the, the gist of it is. And he came home, he came over one day and he said, you're not going to believe it. There's this software that I can download that will turn my computer essentially into a control room and a, and a switcher, generate graphics. It's like what would be thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in hardware is you know, a subscription, an affordable subscription a month, and we can do all this stuff. And so we've just started playing around with it and we're growing and growing and growing. And I got the live bug. So on uh, February 13th, we're doing something called Mad Love Jambalaya, Mad mm -hmm. Love and Jambalaya, and a Cajun chef named Jamil Johnson, who's amazing and a character is going to teach me to make jambalaya and it's going to be pre Valentine's day, pre Mardi Gras. It's oh, going to fun. be. Yeah. So that's the next one that's coming up. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited about it. Well, you know, what's fun is that I took a screenshot of your show 
when you were doing your 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 own cooking show with guests and then i took a screenshot of you when you were on the today show and i i don't know if you saw this but i did a, a, a short that i put on 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 youtube i think i put it on reels or tiktok maybe i don't know but basically i was like youtube i i right right it's like stream yard stream yard from youtube today show stream yard from youtube <laughs> Today, today show okay like, here's the deal the today show wanted just uh, uh iphones facetime and your and video we, we quality like, was so high quality but when you looked at the way you structured it with the guests and and everything it really like it really didn't make any difference it was that's it what was i'm like, saying unbelievable it does not matter <laughs> <laughs> it does not matter. No one says, oh, I really enjoyed that thing I watched on TV. They, it, right. We don't know anymore. Right. You know, I don't, I'm too old to stay up and watch the late night shows. So what I do is in the morning, I just watch the monologues mm -hmm. on my phone while I'm watching TV technically. Right. But in really, I'm just on my phone watching anything. It's all the same. And right. I think that the, in the sort of at the apex of the pyramid, you have feature films really hardly exist anymore. But what you have is everyone from feature films is doing <laughs> serialized scripted dramas and right. no one's missing popcorn. If you really want it, you can go make some in your microwave. <laughs> well, Another technology. I think even when we the lockdowns lift. The movie theater probably isn't the first place you're gonna go sit. Unfortunately, well, everything for people is gonna who feel own so the movie different. Theater. I know. I, I feel know. bad. Just... I feel bad for all the industries. By the way, the food industry decimated. Mm -hmm. I know. I mean, there's a lot of people that are not gonna come through this in a positive way, and I feel a little bit guilty that uh, COVID has actually been. It's been really good for me. <laughs> I don't like I don't like to admit it, but just yeah. the fact that I could do a show from my phone in my kitchen in my, you know, pajamas, let's call it what right, it is. They right. call them sweats, but I sleep in them too. So they are really pajamas. <laughs> and it's uh yeah, it's 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 a game changer and it, it's very democratic. Right, right. Because the you know, the content that people want to watch is the content that gets the eyeballs. Right. And there's no gatekeepers. So come on, eyeballs, let's go. Matt there's the no kitchen. gatekeepers like, for instance, you were at the Daily Show or Letterman to get past in order to create your content. The gatekeepers exactly. come when you want to monetize it. Then you have to actually get somebody to say yes to you. But to create it and get started, it's so easy now. It's just crazy. Look, and, look. Uh, you know, I'm really having a blast. To, I feel like I'm on a ride. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I've given over to, let's just take this ride. Like, right. you know, let's see, you know, this is what I've done in six months. Mm -hmm. I'm just excited to see what I can pull off in a year. Right. Well, let's take a look back at TV. Aww. You worked with uh, David Letterman. You were obviously uh, either a big fan or somebody who just totally appreciated what he was all about. And you got to work with him. I was watching that clip and I couldn't tell whether you were angry with him or you just didn't really want to be on camera. <laughs> no, no, I did want to be on camera. I was playing the part of the offended employee. So basically, oh, okay. his assistant, <laughs> Lori Diamond, had run the marathon and uh, right. I had handed her a banana, which is what I was told to do, mm -hmm. uh, that a banana was really what they wanted, not water, because they can't really stop to drink but the banana. They can just run and uh, that looks dirty, but it wasn't meant to be. And so when they showed the clip of Lori passing the finish line, you, before there, you see me reach out and hand her a banana. And Dave said, you're just running along and some husky idler like <laughs> comes in and hands you a banana, almost knocks you over. And I was backstage and I was comfortable enough. Then Dave really loved me like Dave. And we if the one the shot on the right is from his final uh, the party for his final show and. We had this, you know, we, I was the one that would always go up to him and just be, I love you, David Letterman. He'd be, I love right. you, Madeline Smithberg. And we always would have those moments at every party. And uh, I adore the man. And he is one of those, you know, sort of like talented in a Platonian way. Like, we'll just find the ideal joke out of thin air. And my segments were all the demos and human interest. So these were uh, civilians, not 
professionals. They were kid right. inventors. They were the lady with potato chips that looked like things. They were border collies herding sheep. They were all the cooking <laughs> demos. I watched that one <laughs> right. just recently. Yeah. So he called me a husky idler, and I wasn't going to stand for that. So I came out onto the set, and I was like, husky idler? And But I was... I wasn't really angry. I was right, just right. sort of seizing a, a an opportunity to call him out and make him uncomfortable. Because my whole like goal when I worked there was to find ways to make Dave uncomfortable because that was the best comedy. <laughs> and so he hugs me later on in that scene, too. He's like, it's Madeline Smithberg, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you're not husky, Madeline. And I was just pretending to be mad. <laughs> that was great. Um, okay, so from there, you created a show called The Daily Show. And yep. being a, a big basketball fan, I was extremely disappointed when Craig Kilborn left. Little did I know that the show would go to entirely new heights when you hired an, another host. How did you find somebody who's now become a, a household name, but at the time was kind of an MTV comedian. Well, I worked, I produced of... his show on MTV. Oh, and okay. uh, I created The Daily Show with Liz Winstead. She was my downstairs neighbor. And uh, the John Stewart Show had been on MTV. I left Letterman with a goal to produce uh, content about food, mm -hmm. like food television that was funny. I had a, a company called Half-Baked Productions, and I produced a pilot <laughs> from Eating New York, that ended up on the desk of Eileen Katz, who ran original programming for MTV, who was a foodie. And she had Jon Stewart literally in the basement to do a late night show and put us together. And we fell in professional love. And we did the Jon Stewart show for two years on MTV. And they got syndicated by Paramount when the Viacom Paramount merger, uh, CBS merger happened. And uh, we moved to the show into syndication and went to an hour and it was the worst and best nine months of my life because we just syndication's an evil game and we were just losing stations like, you know, at like a leaky dinghy. It was just really right. horrible. And then the people that had been at MTV, Doug Herzog and Eileen Katz had moved to Comedy Central and I was essentially recruited by Doug Herzog to create a daily show for the network and i turned it down for nine months and then sold them another show and then one day he just you know said what are you doing i'm putting all of my resources behind this show and said the words that sealed the deal you don't have to do a pilot you will stay on for a year and so liz and i just built a team of the funniest hilarious but like news junkies and we, little by little, got closer and closer. And one day, a group of us said, why don't we just pretend we're 24 we're cable news? Like, that was the <laughs> joke. And then we can do anything we want. And so the real bones of the show were there. And then Doug really loved Craig because he loved Sports Center. And everybody trashes Craig. But I had a great relationship with him. And we called him Ted Baxter because he had great comedic timing and would read anything. And so the writers were really empowered. And the show that would be then turned over to John and transformed really had the, the structure. Like the moment of Zen was my cat. My cat used to watch Charles Geralt. And the, it, it, now we leave you with the egrets waiting on the shores of northern Nebraska. And I thought, ooh, we should end our show with the most disturbing piece of footage and call it the moment of Zen. And so that was that. And when I watched the show to this day, right. I see so much of me. Like we hired Lewis Black. I wrote that intro. If a news story falls through the cracks, Lewis Black catches it for a segment we call Back in Black. That's me. But I wasn't mm -hmm. in the Writers Guild at the time. But uh, so, yeah. So John and I were friends and knew each other. And uh when Craig left, uh, I was offered to by Dave Letterman to go to CBS and move to California to do Craig's show. And I called my friend John. I go, what do I do? And he was like, I'm going to come host the Daily Show, stay here. So that's sort of like how that happened. And then the thing just. But for, here's the example of how great it was to, to work for a place like Comedy Central where they let creative people be creative. When I hired Stephen Colbert, which is before John was there, uh, I saw a tape. It was called Waiters Who Are Nauseated by Food. It was sent to me by an agent. 
<laughs> and I said, I want that guy. When can he start? I didn't have to like get network approval. I just hired him and he started on Monday. You know, it was so beautiful. And then I called the same age. I go, do you have another one? He goes, yeah, go back to the tape. The other waiter is his friend, Steve Carell. And I go, well, <laughs> when can he start? You know, it was just like, right. you didn't have to go through this entire process. And you asked me before about leaving the world of TV. The last 10 years of show business for me and living in LA were horrific. And as it was like, one day someone dropped a bowling ball in the industry and splattered it all over Southern California. And it was like a jellyfish. You had all these little tiny, you know, kind of beings that were now still alive, but not connected. And to pitch a show, you'd have to go to 18 different meetings and nobody had any budgets. And what got empowered were these terrible executives that were so scared that they were going to lose their jobs because they were, because the industry was changing that nobody was willing to just say, you have a track record. We're going right. to let you do the work that you do. And it got more and more uh, depressing and demoralizing. So I was really ready for a change uh, when I moved here to be with Sam. And I just, if you had, had asked me what it was going to be uh, two years prior, I would have probably just looked at you blankly because I had no idea. I just knew that. I just knew right. that. This wasn't working for Madeline Smithberg. Like, I just, I, it was absolutely god awful. So now I have full control. <laughs> I, you know, I can do anything I want. I want to have pizza races. Let's call the pizzerias. <laughs> like, it's just so liberating and so much fun. And I'm feeling just like tinges of the original excitement of the beginning of the Daily Show, which is we're just kids playing right. with the world now when craig left and and john came on was there a, a dip before it took off or did it take off immediately no it did not take off immediately it took us a, we we i know the exact moment that the daily show that would emerge uh took form and it started we did a, a special you should check it out it was called the greatest millennium and it was our our uh it was our year end special for 1999. And so we called it The Greatest Millennium because Tom Brogo had a book called <laughs> The Greatest Generation. So we did a look back at the thousand years. It was hilarious. It was very conceptual. We had, they might be giants as a house band. We did some incredible, 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 silly and brilliant comedy. And that to me was like a seismic shift had uh, emerged. And the thing about it was that we were angry. We were mm -hmm. angry at the media. We were angry at the m world. We were angry at injustices, but we were also silly. And so it was a way of kind of taking your anger and channeling it into hilarity that mm -hmm. we got us ready for the 2000 election. And I, The Daily Show became The Daily Show in the 34 days after the 2000 election, mm -hmm. where it would take 35 years, 35 days, 34, 35 for the Supreme Court to give it to George Bush, that the, the real media couldn't really uh, say what they were thinking. And so everybody just started watching us in the media. And mm -hmm. suddenly I'm on CNN, John's on the cover of this, we're here, we're there. And we became the, the show of record. And that's where it really, really, really happened. We, we were live for two hours and Florida flipped in the middle of our show Oh, wow. And all my friends were at a Comedy Central party waiting for me, and I was watching the country unravel and trying to make it funny. We had, like, little jokes written about every state, and it was so far beyond that. And then the next day, we went on the air <laughs> and pretended we'd been on the air the whole time. So Stephen Colbert is smoking. <laughs> John is, like, completely disheveled. There's coffee cups everywhere. And so it began. And in those, you know, days that followed we would just find more and more ways of sh shining a mirror on this absurd and tragic and uh, in, in, in unacceptable situation. And I did a story that I really love, which was I sent Stephen Colbert to Florida. Mm -hmm. And the premise was old people cannot make decisions. And so what <laughs> uh, in groups. And so what we did is we went to a senior home and we told them that 
if they did our interview, we would buy them lunch. And then we gave them five menus and left it up to them to decide what they were going to order. Right. To show that these are the people that you let decide your election. And uh, it was hilarious. It was hilarious. Steven just like, and I loved it because it was like an idea that worked. And we did so much great stuff. And it was in that time that just we emerged out of the pack as the only show on TV that was going to tell it like it was. Uh, and it really needed to be told. And so it was just like my viral video. It right. was a confluence of circumstances that just all came together. And it was a very fun ride. It started out, you were more skewering the media, it seemed like. And then at some point, it was really making fun of the people who were making news as much as it was the people who were covering it. Right. That's where yeah. you were able to interject to be, yeah. your viewpoint, so to speak, on what Correct. needed to be said, uh, but doing it through a comedic parody of the news. Now, did you have people who were in the news business go, Madeline, what are you doing? You're making us look silly. I'm trying to no, trying to make a no. living. <laughs> no, they loved us. Mm -hmm. They loved us because we got to do what they all wanted to do. And so we became a uh, a real darling of the media, which is just ironic. And it just shows that everybody loves being made fun of because people want to be talked about no matter what you are saying. Right, and right. they all have their own personal feelings about, you know, what had happened to media. And I have a lot of <laughs> theories about that. And we can do another show and I can tell you about them. But uh, it, it we were the media darling because we were making fun of them and they loved it. But we were also able, because we were a comedy show, <laughs> to say things that everybody thought but couldn't say in their own uh, show. Wow. Well, you, you've had such an amazing career. There's so much that we could talk about. If you did want to come back, we could do a, a part two at some point. And it's always great to ask the person when you're on the, the air, because how are they going to say no? Uh, <laughs> but uh, we do want to take one last look at how you do your production. There it is, an ATEM Mini Pro. You've got the multi, uh, multi-camera screen, the DSLR, the mic on top. You're in your kitchen, and... Uh, it, it's a terrific production. It, it's really professional, but it's fun. It's down to earth, and uh, we love it. Uh, Madeline Smith, Bird, Thank Mad you. in the Kitchen. And, of course, subscribe to her YouTube channel and not only get great recipes, but comedy and a lot more youtube.com slash mad in the kitchen madeline thank you so Ross, much for I spending just, time i have two people scott's holding his phone and myself and i want to say sure. hello and thank you to bruce rachel and a special hello to chris fenwick thank you for having me sure. on i'll come back anytime uh i i had a blast this is fun uh i love Streamyard. it's it, it's made it me be able to do what i do from my kitchen well it's awesome thank you so much madeline and when can thank we look you. for your next video next show we should subscribe uh, to the youtube be, channel we're going to be dropping videos every friday at okay. noon pacific that's our new schedule we're really gearing up to that uh the next uh live show i believe is the today show i'm on the jason show again uh when is the date uh, oh, oh, we're doing a campaign. We're oh, doing okay. a campaign, and it's called uh, What's in Your Fridge? And basically, we're asking people to shoot short videos showing us what is in your refrigerator. And when I did my video, I discovered that I have more cheese than a person should possibly have. <laughs> and I broke the cheese drawer as I was displaying it. So look for what's in your fridge and please post it with the hashtag and send us your videos. You can just post them on my Facebook page, my YouTube channel. You can message me, Twitter me. I'm at Matt in the Kitchen uh, all over the place and Matt in the Kitchen. Uh, is the page on Facebook. And of course, Matt in the Kitchen is my YouTube channel where I need you. Subscribe, Don't let me down. Subscribe, subscribe. I need subscribe. You to like and subscribe <laughs> and subscribe, subscribe.
And, Thank and ring you. that bell <laughs> so you get notified. Thank you so ring much, that Madeline. Bell. So you never miss an episode. There you go. So much fun. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Ross. That's Madeline Smithberg, Mad in the Kitchen. Subscribe to her YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Mad in the Kitchen. And uh, just really a fun conversation. And again, we're spotlighting people and, and who better to talk to about working in TV and now using StreamYard to do your own production. And uh, she's doing some great stuff over on YouTube in a variety of different areas from the viral video with uh, shorts to produced uh, YouTube videos, long live streams. Uh, it's the whole panoply of uh, different types of video creation. And it's from... Uh, a, a real true uh, television and, and video professional. So uh, an honor to have Madeline on. And uh, we are, of course, honored that you all join us each week, every week, 2 p.m. Eastern for StreamYard Connect. And we'll tell you about some other shows as well that we have here on StreamYard. You can check out the Town Hall every Sunday night with Gage and Dan, the co-founders, will answer your questions they'll also update you on what's going on with the platform new features get your opinions on some of the things that they're working on and what they'd like to see tuesdays at 11 a.m eastern it's Streamyard tech talk with daniel glickman and then tuesday nights you can catch dana bentz hosting two cents with bentz at 8 p.m eastern and then Dana and her sister, Kelsey, every Thursday night, 8 p.m., they interview you, the StreamYard user. If you are using StreamYard in a way that you find uh, others might be interested in, go ahead and reach out to them. They're always looking for guests from the StreamYard community. Dana and Kelsey do a great show. StreamYard Spotlight Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern. And then, as I'm losing my voice here, <clears throat> Come back, please, and join us next week on Wednesday and every week on Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern for StreamYard Connect here on the StreamYard Facebook page, YouTube channel, and on Periscope and Twitter as well. Thank you again, everybody, for being here, and hope your 2021 is off to a good start, and wishing you all the best for a great New Year. Take care, everybody.